Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, I'd like to thank Dean Anheyer for inviting me to join you here on such an important day. It's an honor to address so many outstanding young leaders, the class of 2014, from all over the world at this special moment in their life. To the parents in the audience, I too attended my daughter's graduation ceremony with my wife only a few weeks ago. I know how proud you are. You deserve to be. It's heartening to realize that your sons and daughters have incredible knowledge at their disposal and therefore incredible potential in their professional and personal lives. I've also had the privilege, as um, Helmut was saying, to teach in similar programs. And so I know the pride and satisfaction the faculty feels today. The culmination of a long, challenging, but infinitely rewarding academic journey. And these fine students would never have made it to this day were it not for you. But as this is the 10th anniversary of the Hertie School of Governance, I would like to celebrate with you the process of critical thinking. This process will be invaluable to all. All of you who are graduating today, whether you go into the private, public, or nonprofit sector. This process is crucial if you are to live up to the ambitious goals Hertie's Master of Public Policy program has set out for you, and I quote, enable students to understand how governance works and contribute to make it better, promote good policies that in turn promote the public good, hands-on problem solving, critical discussion of policy innovations and evaluation of solutions. In fact, what we are asking of you and what you have decided to become are agents of change. And in choosing this path in life, you bring optimism to the world. You carry with you, and please keep it alive, the belief that, yes, we can change this world. A tall order. But you're following a magnificent tradition a tradition that began in ancient Greece when politics was invented. What was politics in the eyes of the ancient Greeks? It was the belief that we citizens could take our fate into our own hands, that we need not be dominated by the whims of tyrants, constrained by the monopoly on knowledge or the dogmas of the high priests. No, we could liberate our potential, imagine a different world, and collectively, create a better society. That simple idea was a revelation, and at the same time, a revolution. Democracy disrupted the concentration of power in the hands of the few. It put knowledge, inquiry, curiosity at the center of society. The word school comes from the ancient Greek word skoli, which means actually leisure time. Learning was fun. It was theater. It was music, architecture, scientific inquiry. It was walking with Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, philosophizing. It was athletics, games. It was a deep belief in every person's potential. And most important, learning through participation. Participation in the daily workings and decisions of the city. Now, I am idealizing a bit but I want to emphasize the importance of critical thinking in politics. When I finished my studies, I did not want to get into politics. My father had been in jail twice, and my grandfather six times, both fighting for something called democracy. So if you think I faced difficult crises, think again. But I too had lived through a dictatorship and seven years of political exile. By the time I had finished secondary school, I had changed nine schools and lived in four different countries. This gave me the possibility to do what Hertie does so well, to cross boundaries, break down walls, to assess different systems, practices, cultures, societies. So I knew deep down that Greece could become a better place. And when I got into politics, it was to become as you are a change agent. But that is not as easy as it sounds. A few days after winning my first election, 
I sat down with my friends in my constituency. What should be my first steps, I asked them. Their advice was, for the most part, that I should change. You have to show that you are powerful. Wear a dark suit. Buy a big black car, a Mercedes. <laughs> when you talk to people, don't get into too much dialogue. Bang your fist on the table to make a point and cut your hair. I had hair then. <laughs> I was initially swayed. I felt that I needed to take on the trappings of power in order to be effective. But at some point I said to myself, that's not me. I got into politics not to become like the leaders I despised. I'm going to follow a different approach, more open, democratic, inquisitive, and no black car. I soon developed my own distinct political style, which was gradually accepted. So a first lesson, know thyself. Be careful with what you conform to. If you feel you need to change to grow, do so. But if your style, your idiosyncrasies, what others might think as flaws or frailties, if they are part of your values and your life choices, they can become your advantage and help you become an agent of change. Here's another example. When I became Minister of Foreign Affairs, we were on the brink of war with Turkey. My counterpart sent me a threatening letter with a number of demands. Diplomats insisted I should reject these demands. This was a safe option. But it didn't feel right. Two countries, two intertwined histories, two neighbors. My responsibility was to try for change, not fall into easy solutions of a shouting match or escalating tensions. So I responded positively to the minister's request, but added a list of our own issues for discussion. By acting counterintuitively, by taking a risk, we were able to start a sincere dialogue. Then a few months later, a massive earthquake took place near Istanbul. Thousands were trapped under the rubble. I decided to take another risk. I publicly called on the Greek people to give blood. The response was overwhelming. In massive numbers, Greeks ran to blood banks to support their Turkish neighbors. One Turkish minister insisted Turkey would not accept Greek blood. But my counterpart, Ismail Cem, also taking a risk, intervened and welcomed the, to the gesture. We then sent a team of rescuers to dig for survivors. The most moving scene was when a Greek rescuer, rescuer pulled out a young Turkish boy alive from the rubble. Turkish newspapers ran titles thanking us in Greek. A month later, the Turks came to our help when another earthquake struck, this time just outside Athens. Very soon, our citizens took up the initiative, from trade to sports to civic organizations. Today, tourism is booming. We had turned this crisis into an opportunity. So what lessons can be learned from this? Don't follow your tribal instincts. Don't hide behind walls or borders. Don't be held back by deep-rooted fears. Step back, take a moment for neutral but critical inquiry. Only then can you really understand what change is needed before working to bring that change about. Now, you will also face failures or even defeat in your life. Again, learn from it. When I took over as the leader of Greece's Social Democratic Party, PASOK, it was just weeks before a guaranteed election defeat. But this gave me the opportunity to launch radical party reforms. I opened up the party to direct democracy, brought in women, migrants, inviting the public to choose the party top and local leaders and decide our policy priorities directly and also through online debates. This new transparency and accountability helped us win the next elections in 2009. 
This brings me to a bigger point. If you want to be an agent of change, try to recognize the moment when the potential for change is the greatest, a crisis. I know this from personal experience. Within weeks of being elected prime minister, Greece became embroiled in the worst global economic crisis in its post-war history. From the beginning, I saw the crisis also as an opportunity, an opportunity to put push through radical reforms that would make our governance system more accountable, transparent, our economy more just and sustainable. From the tax system to the pension system, the public sector to local government, I was determined to use the crisis to change Greece for the better. Because our debt and deficits were only the symptoms of deeper issues. Yes, I had a vision, yes, a dream, but at the same time, I had to weigh my options between bankruptcy and abandoning the euro or going through a grueling, painful process of adjustment. My options were between the bad and the worse. And in your lives, you may have to make such choices. One word of caution. As a policymaker, you will always be looked to for quick fix solutions. Unfortunately, they rarely exist. Don't promise them. There are no easy solutions. While Greece was saved, we've made remarkable progress, and Europe helped out. The dominant narrative in the EU was that austerity was the quick fix solution. Cuts rather than reforms were the priority of the Troika. That had enormous social costs and political consequences. But this speaks to a larger issue, how to effect meaningful change in any organization, be it a country or a company. The American environmental scientist Donella Meadows talked about the concept of leverage points, changes that can produce huge systemic shifts. She said, the easiest thing that you can do is to change numbers, raise revenues, cut costs, reduce the number of employees, but this is actually the least effective way to reach a desired goal. It's harder to make a major change in physical infrastructure, but ultimately, that pays greater dividends. It's harder still to change the rules of the system, laws, bylaws, policies, guidelines, but this can bring about monumental changes in a relatively short time span. Finally, you see that the hardest thing you can do is to change the mindset of the organization, to reshape the beliefs, the goals of the community. But if you can do that, the sky is the limit. A friend of mine, Ron Heifetz, who teaches leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School, has a good analogy for how leaders need to respond in a crisis. Ron says, when you have a heart attack, you need to get straight to intensive care. The treatment is standard, standard procedures, oxygen, transfusions, medicines, and so on. So at this initial stage, leadership is straightforward, even technical. The more difficult part, assuming you survive, is afterwards, dealing with the root causes of the heart attack, changing your lifestyle, letting go of bad habits, instilling new patterns of behavior. And that requires a different type of leadership. It's not a solution you simply deliver. It means creating the mindset for adaptation. It is a different politics, politics as education, a learning process through deeper participation where everyone takes on responsibility, everyone plays his or her part. That was and that is my vision for Greece, and that is why I called for a referendum on Greece's second bailout package to make sure our solutions were owned by the Greek people. The only sure way to change a mindset and implement drastic reforms. That decision cost me my job, but it forced a coalition government and greater cooperation. A final lesson. If necessary, don't shy away from one of the most difficult decisions in your life, to step down, to bow out, to be voted out if your actions benefit the public good. Learn to use power well and wisely, but don't be enamored 
by power. Let me conclude with some of today's challenges that you will face as future leaders. You are an enormously advantaged and at the same time challenged generation. Today, humankind has the capacity, knowledge, experience, even resources to solve most problems, to make poverty, climate change, illiteracy, unemployment, history. But we have no governance structures to run this world in an efficient or just way, to use resources sustainably for the environment and humanely for our societies. Politics is still local, while our economy is global. So that makes it difficult to fight injustices and inequalities. Your job will be to help construct the local, national, and supranational policies and structures that shape global governance. To democratize, I would call it globalization, humanize globalization. Europe itself may be the best roadmap we have for this kind of transnational governance. Using our own unique brand of soft power, Europe has proven that we can shape global norms, raise global standards in many areas from food safety, environmental standards to privacy and competition laws, promoting democracy and a social contract, a basic bargain. But globalization, with all its opportunities, has its downside. And the European model, the social contract, and values such as democracy and human rights are under threat. Under threat because we are competing in a race to the bottom, a race we can never and should not want to win. But this race to the bottom is creating huge inequalities, insecurity, and tension. As we face these global challenges, many of our citizens are putting their hopes in new saviors, authoritarian figures, populists, new gods, or building walls for easy solutions, creating new borders. Yesterday's vote in Europe was riding on these walls. As leaders, you will face a clash, not of cultures, but of different models of governance. Democratic leadership on the one hand, or modern day equivalent of the ancient Greek usurpers of powers, tyrants, magicians, high priests. You will face those who are creating walls of inequality through money, media, or even the amazing new technologies as they are amassing and concentrating power, power they should not have. You will face the Boko Harams who hate your knowledge. You will face oligarchs who fear your freedom of thought. You will face technocrats, and I can name a few economists, who are more religious in their beliefs than high priests. You, as agents of change, will be challenged to reverse these trends, to break down these barriers and new Berlin walls, to use your knowledge and insight to create governance systems that can disrupt this concentration of power, make choices that liberate the potential of our citizens and societies. Yes, our societies face huge challenges and seem splintered, polarized, xenophobic, dominated by a politics of fear. You will need to be agents of cooperation, solidarity, bridge building, and understandings, a politics of hope. It might sound like a cliche, but you are truly citizens of the world. You have unprecedented capabilities to connect, collaborate, crowdsource, and coordinate that my generation never had. You are the forerunners of a new global consciousness. You can bring about the changes our globalized world so badly needs. Your path will not be easy. But as a Greek poet, Kavafi wrote, as you set out for Ithaca, hope your journey is a long one, full of adventure, discovery. Less Dragonians and Cyclops, angry Poseidon. Don't be afraid of them. You won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. As global citizens and leaders, you are challenged, yes, to break down barriers, not to fear diversity, 
not to fear innovation, not to fear the other, the stranger, even the unknown, but you are also challenged to create foundations, structures, educate for values and principles that will create a commons, a unity of global citizenship, a demos, which will allow us to govern this planet in a much more humane, sustainable, and just way. Good luck. Believe in yourselves because we believe in you. Thank you.